Hello everyone, welcome to Future Cities Lab podcast. Here in Singapore, I'm your host, Thandi. In September last year, the UN announced that 66 countries vow to achieve carbon neutrality by the year 2050. What does this mean for the governments of these countries? How does it affect companies and corporations? And what does it mean for us as individuals? Hello everyone and welcome to Future Cities Laboratory podcast. I'm your host, Tanbi, and we have with us here Jimeno Fonseca, Senior Researcher and Principal Investigator at Future Cities Laboratory. And today we will talk about carbon neutrality, what it means, and how do we get there. Welcome, Jimeno, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Tanbi. So I want to begin by asking, what does it mean to achieve carbon neutrality? Is it an achievable goal? Yeah, I think I think it is. I mean, carbon neutrality, I mean, it's such a big goal to achieve. Uh, but basically, it entails that we reach a balance with the environment in terms of the emissions we produce and the emissions that we are able to reduce or offset elsewhere. Um, it's a achievable goal in the sense that we have already, as you said, 66 nations pledging together to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. We come with the technology and potentially the, the economic instruments to make this possible. So what do you think these 66 countries and their governments need to do in order to achieve carbon neutrality? So there are a number of strategies you can do from the level of, of, of behavior, also technology, and uh, behavior influenced by social economic aspects or taxation, right? Uh, so when we talk about what we can do, the first thing that comes to, to mind uh, as a government is carbon taxation or carbon tax. Carbon tax, what exactly what does that mean? So carbon tax is an instrument in which basically um, big producers of CO2 emissions get a tax, get a basically uh, a money taxation for every ton of CO2 that they produce. The main principle of this is that we can use that money to finance projects elsewhere that help us to reduce carbon emissions. So then we can reach that balance in an economically feasible way. Already about 20 Nobel laureates, about 3,000 economists signed a pledge last year saying that this is the most cost-effective strategy to accelerate the transition from a high fossil fuel economy to a low carbon economy and hopefully reach carbon neutrality by 2050. This is like the best strategy governments can do. Hmm, but when you say tax, I mean already uh, we have a taxation system and then we have tax evasion, we have tax havens. I don't know, does that replicate in a carbon taxation environment? At this point it's not, in the sense that we have, uh, we only tax mainly big, big consumers and big producers of energy, big industries that are will, widely well represented, which are difficult to evade taxes, the world is recognized, which is part of the problem and the solution. Because in the sense, we are not heavily taxing people who actually are producing a lot of emissions as we should. Those carbon taxes are really, really small to actually make a difference. Um, for example, um, in, the, in Singapore, we come with a tax of about $3, US dollars, per ton of CO2. While Countries which actually have made possible this transition count with taxes of about 100 euros or 100 dollars per ton of CO2. Mm. Since the 1990s, we're talking about, for example, Sweden, which started with a carbon tax of about 50 dollars in 1997. In about 2007, they raised it to already 100 dollars. And that made possible that Sweden is one of the, let's say, the, the powerhouses of renewable energy, right? Special investment in biomass and leading this transition to carbon neutrality, as well as many other European countries. Germany just signed a treaty for to, to establish a carbon tax of $50 uh, per ton of CO2, which is representative. Uh, and it's important because, I mean, to better understand a little bit about carbon taxation, it's really important that everybody understands it, is that why is important this number of $50 or $5? Why, what does it make the difference? It makes it a lot because the societal cost of climate change are some, somewhere in between $50 and $8,000 per CO2, per ton of CO2 emissions. And that accounts for all the health costs, 
all the catastrophes that climate change basically encompasses. So you should put, in essence, a carbon tax that is similar to the social cost to actually make things possible and reach a balance. So a tax of $3 or even $20 would not make it to cover all the societal costs. And not even the technological costs, right? Uh, when we talk about technologies like a solar, we think that we need to invest at least 20 to $30 in solar to offset one ton of CO2, right? So if your carbon tax is smaller than that, then it makes it really difficult for this type of new technologies to thrive. And that's the main issue. I was wondering how a carbon tax would play out in emerging economies and developing countries. Well, that's a, a tough question, I think. Um, I don't know if it works with a carbon tax, but it's, it works more with the strategy that, that goes in parallel to carbon taxation that is called carbon credits. And this is, goes in connection to that issue that you talk about tax evasion, right? If that could be possible. And actually, carbon credits, they search as an idea that companies can actually buy credits from other countries, other industries, which are actually offsetting CO2 emissions. So in the case of, of, of developing countries, there are developing countries, especially in South America, for example, that produce a lot of hydropower, that actually are producing new plants to, to uh, utilize gas methane from land, landfills and then offset CO2 emissions. So these, basically, these uh, developing countries have the opportunity to sell credits to develop economies, which basically help them to offset their emissions. But then there's one caveat with that. And the issue is that once you make this a market of trading credits, then there are, of course, the nuances of typical stock markets in the sense of who sets the prices about offer and demand. Speculation. And there is a speculation. There is all those nauseous things. And many companies today have set this idea of carbon credits as a vehicle to actually offset their emissions, but still be able to have a leeway with the market in the sense that it can fluctuate, so it can actually, at a certain point, they could start paying less for every ton of CO2 that they offset, right? While they actually should be paying more or the right price, right? So there's no tax evasion today itself, but there are some instruments that have been found to actually have a way around so to not have that heavy tax toll. It's not uncommon for companies and corporations to find ways to evade tax. Uh, what can companies and corporations do in order to achieve carbon neutrality? What's a good way to go about this? So, I mean, now the, the, the good way, now the practical one is to invest on, on, on vehicles such as energy efficiency. Uh, that's one, I mean, the low-hanging fruit has been there for a long time, but it's quite um, effective, let's say, locally if you can. Um, for some type of industry, it's really heavy, the investment that you will need for energy efficiency. So you would think about these carbon credits, but you could get it from a source that is certified, that is well controlled, um, that probably is not in a, in a market of carbon credits, but that is issued by an institution, a local government, that actually guarantees that those $20 that you invest there are actually investing in this solar PV perhaps plant or, or, or biomass um, uh, industry uh, elsewhere in the world, for example. Yeah, so that's something that they could do. The other thing they can do is it has to do a lot with the culture, uh, company culture. There are many companies, especially a lot of, if we talk about universities as companies, let's say at a certain point, that are basically pushing together this idea of limiting the, the business flights of the research staff or actually uh, getting rid of all cluttery and all plastics for every single event they do. Uh, these kind of things that are part of the culture of the company. Uh, I think there's something can make a big effect. Um, and that hopefully translates to the personal level, which is at the end the, the most difficult part, the behavioral part. Uh, I think the thing where we need more innovation, but where people actually can, by changing their lifestyle, make a lot of, uh, important benefits to the environment. And that can actually come up top down from the company or at the individual level, I think it's part of the culture. We spend more than a half of our times working, right? So it's inherently that you get influenced by your company in how your lifestyle is. 
Could you expand on that? How can I, as an individual, contribute to this goal of achieving carbon neutrality? Yeah, I think one of the simplest way is to limit in your consumption of different products. Today, as we are based on a fossil fuel economy, every single garment that we have is constituted to at least 80% of oil at a certain point, right? Um, analysts say that if you use your current garments for nine months more than you expect to do it, you could save at least 40% of all the emissions due to the clothes that you use, right? Just extending the service life of the consumables, right? Uh, so that is one part, right? That can help a lot, especially because it's really difficult to offset emissions from the uh, textile industry. That's one of the most difficult ones. Uh, you can do it from energy, easily. Let's say you can do from business flights one day, one day. But for materials and all textiles, it's going to be very difficult. So just restricting your consumption could help a lot. That's one part. And the second thing is about the things that you eat, basically, your diet. Um, so we know that agriculture processes, and especially all the dairy industry, produce around 30% of the emissions of the world, all the CO2 emissions. So if you can offset some of those products from your diet, you already contribute to reduce a huge amount of emissions uh, locally. And there are good alternatives to do that. And, and that actually it's connected strongly with new technology that helps you to have new product substitutes into your diet. We have already seen different companies, especially based on the US. Maybe you have heard about Beyond Burger, for example, and Impossible Burger. And what they try to do is that is just give you a substitute of a really widely cared um, kind of product, changing your diet for something that is more environmentally friendly that can contribute actually to reach this carbon neutrality. Those are some typical examples. And finally, I just want to ask you as a researcher working on many technologies and methods to uh, achieve carbon neutrality, what is your vision for the future city in terms of energy? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a tricky question, I think. And, and the problem is that we as engineers and researchers, we have something called techno-optimism. Um, and we are really optimism, optimistic about things that could happen in the future. And we could say that uh, things like renewables, for example, will overtake all, all the type of energy resources we use today. We tend to think about that today and that that could be the alternative. Um, but I cannot avoid thinking that other type of technologies that haven't been explored so widely and have been marginalized for the issue of fear uh, cannot actually help us a lot in the transition. And I'm talking about new type of nuclear reactors, for example. That's a new technology uh, that has been revisited, especially with the backup of the Bill Gates Foundation. It's called the Traveling Web Reactor. This is one type of technology that is several times safer, cheaper, and also faster than current nuclear technology. Right? And in difference to current nuclear technology, it will avoid that all those gases that could happen during an explosion basically get spread through continents or through, um, or through diverse areas for the years to come. With this technology, that doesn't happen, especially because they don't work at really different high pressures and other technical nuances that nuclear technology has today, is to be understood that I mean, nuclear technology has been designed since the 1960s, where we didn't have digital technologies such as computers and supercomputers. And all the reactors that exist in the world are based on that technology. But the new reactors that they are thinking ahead, they actually are able to leverage all this digital technology to make a highly efficient technology, which is claimed to actually be able to use all the spent fuel and all the waste fuel that we have from nuclear uh, for the years to come. Just to put into perspective, if the US and these reactors make it to the market, just by using all the waste fuel, all the waste uh, uh, spent fuel from nuclear, which is a big environmental problem, just using it, they can power the entire US for about 500 years. Stop. If we use these nuclear reactors with the type of uranium that today is getting basically wasted from the enrichment, if we use it, we can also power entire US for a thousand years. Right? So the possibilities are really huge. But of course, 
the technology, I mean, there's issue between technology and also what society is willing to accept and the risk to, they were willing to accept. But I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to discard it as a possibility, right? As something that if they make it in five years or, or even 10 years, they could completely shift all our conceptions of what a low carbon economy or carbon neutrality means in terms of producing safe, affordable and secure energy in cities, for example. From carbon tax to the nuclear reactor of the future, thank you so much for this very enlightening discussion, Jimeno. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to come to you.